morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. We're glad you're here with us today. And um, it's a wonderful thing to be uh, with each other. And, and welcome to those who are watching online. We may have a sev several of those this, uh, this week. And uh, very grateful that uh, the Lord is with us. Uh, we've just begun a series on... Uh, the book of First Peter. So if you could, please turn there this morning. The Bible that you have in front of you in the pew is easy to find. And if you uh, need some help finding First Peter, which is finding hope when life is hard, is on page 1,845, 1845. So Peter is all about suffering and uh, how to respond to suffering and how to find hope in suffering. And uh, what happens particularly today is that Peter is uh, jumping right into the deep end. Has everybody, anybody here ever had swimming lessons where you jumped right into the deep end? Yeah. Or someone throw you into the deep end and say, hey, figure it out? Has that ever happened to you? Yeah. We're into the deep end this morning and um, we are going to be looking at a significant understanding of what the Bible says and why the Bible says it and how important it is to understand the, um, the concept and the teaching of our salvation. And, uh, you know, studying 1 Peter is a lot different than studying some of the books of Paul. For example, in the book of Ephesians, and we will do a series on the book of Ephesians, um, as a matter of fact, we will probably spend about 50% of our uh, messages each year on a book of the Bible, dedicating a book that we will study throughout the year. And about half of the year we'll spend on topics, what does the Bible say about this and what does the Bible say about that. But in, uh, for example, the book of Ephesians, it's really heavy, the first half of Ephesians on doctrine and not on a lot of practical matters. And the last half of the book of Ephesians has a lot of practical uh, value, but not a lot of doctrine. Peter, on the other hand, is about 90% of the book is practical Christianity, and I am a very practical person, so I'm really enjoying getting into First Peter. Um, and so there is uh, some doctrine in Peter, but when Peter does get into doctrine, he gets into it very deep. And so today... As we dig deep into this and you walk out of here today saying, hey, I, this was all right, we, I'm, I'm enjoying this, then you will survive First Peter. We are going to get deep into it today, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, we, uh, our goal today is that we will have a better understanding and uh, appreciation for what God has done for us through Christ, and this is really a significant issue for us in what the Bible says about salvation. So, we need to understand our past and our future so we can live our present. Now, this past is not, you know, why did my dad abandon me when I was five years old? Not that kind of past. We're talking about salvation past and understanding our salvation future so that we can live our present by God's grace. I think you'll see that this morning, that there is a lot here about these different aspects of salvation. And if we do not understand this, our doctrine of salvation can be very, very difficult for us to get our heads around. And so... Um, and the future that we're talking about here, too, isn't like 10 years from now or when I retire, even though some of you are looking forward to that. Uh, no, no. <laughs> All right, so we are going to now read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. So if you have your Bibles there, you can follow along. It says here, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead 
and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. That, my brothers and sisters, is the gospel message. We are going to take a close look at it here in our message. But I want to say this. We can only have hope in suffering if we understand our past and our future. And let's take a look at this closely. The context of today's message is what we talked about last week when we mentioned that those who respond to the call, and this is election, God calls everyone. He calls every human being. He died for every human being. He calls all people. And those who choose are chosen by God the Father, right? So if you respond to the call, God has chosen you. But we all can respond. And he calls us freely to respond. We are set apart by the Holy Spirit. In other words, we are sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And then sprinkled by the blood of Jesus, meaning that Jesus took the place of our sins. He took the penalty for us. And when we review that from last week, the context of what Peter starts out with verse 3 is praise be to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for this. He just breaks out into praise as he begins writing his letter. And I think that this is a wonderful lesson for us, is that we can, by God's grace, break out into praise. We should never stop praising God for what he has done for us. Peter's writing this letter, an intro, and all of a sudden he just bursts into praise. Have you found it in your walk with God that when you are suffering and you decide to start praising God for this and praising God for that and praising God for the other thing, pretty soon you don't feel as bad as you used to. Has anybody ever tried that? Right? We get so focused, so consumed with what we're going through that we forget to praise God for the blessings that we do have. These are very practical things that Peter is showing. He is praising God, breaking into praise. Now, salvation's definition that we will be looking at today in simple terms is rescue or delivered. Salvation, in its original language, is rescued or delivered. And so, if we get to a, a more technical definition, theologically speaking, it is the spiritual state of a convicted sinner who is resting by faith in the forgiveness that God freely offers in Christ. That is the definition of salvation. Forgiveness allows us to have a relationship with God. He forgives us because of Jesus, and because of that, we rest by faith in what he has done freely through Christ. Now, we see this in verse 3. Um, as we look at it here, we see this praise, and uh, that God has given us his great mercy in the new birth. This is this point where we surrender to Christ and he comes to our rescue. Now, what we are going to look at closely here is this issue of salvation, past, present, and future. This is really important for us to understand this morning. Um, the timing of our salvation. When we speak of present, I mean, excuse me, past, there was a time where we remember a moment where Christ touched our heart, where he moved in our lives, and we accepted him into our hearts. There was this moment. Do you remember it? Can you remember the day or the moment or the time frame where you sensed God's presence so close that your heart melted and you surrendered to him. That moment 
is where we accept the fact that Jesus paid the penalty for our salvation. And it is something that we experience. We don't have to pay the penalty for our own sins. Can you say praise God to that? Jesus paid the penalty. Jesus saves us and rescues us. And when I was in my 20s and I came to realize that I could trust in what God had done for me, it changed everything. That was my salvation past. I remember that. And I experience it anew every day through the surrendering of my heart to him. But there's also, as we look at this, there's a, there's a, um, a, a present salvation And we're going to look at a couple of verses that maybe have been confusing for you because they've been for me. If anybody thinks I have it all figured out, I'm learning along with you every single day. Um, But being saved in the present sense is being saved from the power of sin in our lives. This is called sanctification. This This is where we grapple and struggle with the flesh. And we realize that God's power works in us, and he is rescuing us and delivering us from the power of sin. Can you say amen? And then the Bible, this is what the Bible says. Therefore, my friends, my dear friends, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. When I first read this verse, it freaked me out. How many here have read this verse and said, man alive, I don't know if I have salvation. When you read this verse, this is talking about salvation present. This is delivering and rescuing from the power of sin. It's not that moment where you accepted Jesus as your Savior and accepted the atonement that he gave for you and I when he died on the cross. That salvation past, salvation present, deliverance and rescue right now is from the power of sin. The power of sin loves to strangle the life out of Christians. Would you say amen to that? When, we, when it says here, work out your salvation, the, the deliverance from the power of sin with fear, respect, trembling, for it is God who works In you, this is talking about the struggle between our flesh and what we desire to do as God's children. It's vital that we understand this. Look at this verse, 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are what? Being saved. That sounds like a process, and it is. The process of being saved and delivered from the power of sin is present. It's a battle right now. And this is what we face as followers of Jesus. So we have salvation past, saved from sin's penalty. Salvation present, saved from sin's power. And now we have salvation future, which is saved from sin's presence. Are you looking forward to the day when sin no longer can touch us? This is our inheritance This is the hope that we have in Jesus, that he is going to come and take us out of this messed up world. And he is going to deliver us, and this is guaranteed by his grace that he will come and take us home. Look at these verses. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is what? It is coming. Are you seeing how the Bible uses salvation differently? Past, present, future. Our deliverance from this world is nearer now than when we first believed. Here's another one. Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring what? That's coming. That's the complete deliverance from the presence of sin in our lives. Can you imagine never being tempted again with anything? Not one thing. 
whether it is tempted to have pride or tempted to lie or tempted to cheat or to steal or to, to be tempted with a lustful thought, tempted with drugs, it's gone, over, it is delivered. We are in the presence of Jesus. These three aspects of salvation are important for us to understand as we go through the book of 1 Peter. If we don't understand them, our theology can be really messed up because if I am fearing and trembling as I work out my own salvation, my friends, then that understanding of salvation in that verse is inaccurate if we believe that that is our deliverance from the penalty of sin. It isn't. It is our deliverance from the power of sin in our lives. Then that is a process, and that is a day-by-day struggle. That's why it says fear and trembling, because it is a struggle. Paul says, I die daily. Paul struggled with it. And so now that verse is not scary anymore. That verse is right along with the teachings of Scripture as we understand salvation past, present, and future. There is a lot here going on in 1 Peter. I want to show you something as we read. Look here as as we look at um, verse 3. It says here, um, Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given. Is that past? Has given is past. And then go down here to verse, uh, verse 5. It says, Who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed. Has it been revealed yet? Then that is salvation future. And now go down to verse 9. We're not going to study this in depth today on verse 9, but it says, it says here, For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That is present. We are receiving it right now. It's a process. God is delivering us from the power of sin. He is. I'm not the person I was 10 years ago. I'm not the person I was 20 years ago, praise God. I'm not the person I was 30 years ago, praise God. He is delivering me day by day from the power of sin. And there's no limit to what God can do in a willing heart. Nothing he isn't able to do. I want to get into our moments here where we have the um, um, the discussion in each verse here. We have an election that's going on. We talked about that last week. It's where God, from the foundation of the world, Jesus was slain from the foundation, from the beginning. This is election. This is for everyone. And we talked about that last week. The next one is regeneration. Regeneration is here as we read the scriptures. It says here, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth. Are you you glad that God gave us great uh, mercy? Does anybody here really want God to be fair to us? I don't want God to be fair with me because fair with me would be justice to me. Jesus has given us great mercy. And he can still be just and merciful because Jesus took the penalty for us. So before the whole universe, God gave his life. He is just and merciful. This new birth, this new hope. Do you remember when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus? And Nicodemus says, what? What? I got to be born again? What does this mean? What's going on? And Jesus says, yes, you must be born again or you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. When we are born physically, we are born dead. We must be born again so that if time lasts, we only die once. The scriptures teach that if we are only born physically once, we will experience the second death. That is the teaching of Scripture. But there's no reason 
any human being ever has to experience that. If time lasts and we pass through the grave, we have hope that we will rise again. That God will completely deliver us from the presence of sin in our lives. There's hope. This verse here in Ephesians is one of my favorites. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. He has made us alive with Christ, even when we were My friends, we don't preach the gospel... It's not about the fact that you may be confused and you need direction. It's not about the fact that you don't have happiness in your life and you want joy. It's not because of this or that. We have the gospel because we were dead and now we are alive. This is the power of the gospel message. In the garden tomb in in Jerusalem, now this is uh, about a quarter mile away from where they believe Jesus actually was buried in a tomb, but it's similar to the look of this. This is in Jerusalem. I was here a few years back. And standing there looking at people going in, when they go in, do you know what they see? Nothing. And when Peter is writing this and he's talking about the resurrection from the dead, that we have a living hope in Jesus. Who was the first one to go into the tomb on resurrection morning? Peter. Peter was the very first eyewitness that he went into an empty tomb, and when he talks about the living hope of the resurrection, do you think that that morning when he walked in there that he'll never forget that feeling of an empty tomb? And what's fascinating is this, is that, do you know who the second person that went into the tomb? John. John was the second one to go into the tomb after Peter. And I want to show you something that is so powerful, because in John's writing, he's also affected by what he saw on resurrection morning with an empty tomb, a living hope because of the resurrection of Jesus. Because Jesus rose from the dead, our salvation is secure because of what he did. Here's what John writes. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Read it with me. So that you may know that you have eternal life. Is there any doubt in the mind of John as he's writing this? Zero doubt. But when we live life and say, I hope... I'm going to make it. It's just wishful thinking. But the Bible does not define hope as wishful thinking. The Bible defines hope as a sure certainty. A sure certainty. There is absolutely no doubt. Because if I doubt... And I hope that I make it to heaven. Will I have anything to share with my neighbor at all? Really? Are you going to go and say, well, you know, kind of, you know, you can try with me. We may make it. We may not. (laughs) We do have choice. But I'm saying that as a follower of Christ and as you walk with him, he has saved you. And he continues to save you from the power of sin. And he continues to promise that we will be delivered from sin's presence, finally and fully free from the, from the presence of sin. There's election There's regeneration, the new birth experience, there's sanctification. Sanctification we'll talk about next week in verse 6, and then there's glorification. I want us to read this in verse 4. And into an inheritance, to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, 
and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. I don't know what earthly thing that we could ever imagine that would have this kind of certainty. Never fade. Never spoil. There is no investment in this planet that will keep its value like what is in heaven. Sometimes we watch our 401k goes up, goes down. It's difficult. This inheritance will never fade, will never lose value. And when sin is no more, there is no more tears, no more fear, no more death, no more pain. No more sorrow, no more loneliness, no more homelessness ever, ever again. Never perish means it's untouched by death. Never spoil means untouched by evil. And never fade is untouched by time. This inheritance is for you, and it is for me. God gives it to us, and we can hope in him and his salvation. This inheritance is there for us, but will we be there to claim it? I'd like to read verse 5. It's astounding. It's an astounding promise that God makes. Who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You and I, by God's power, are being shielded, protected, kept in the fold. He takes us by the hand and he will not let go. He doesn't force anyone. But as we learn more and more about his character, we will never want to leave him, ever. As we come to see his great mercy for us, we will never want to leave him. Now, I don't know what sorrow you have in your life. And I don't want to minimize the suffering that you have in your life. But I have been around people who have faced death and they were overwhelmed with despair as they were breathing their last. It's up to God what he's going to do and that person and God know. But I have seen people be overwhelmed with despair in their last moments. And it is the most difficult thing to see. And I've also been around people who know what we have talked about this morning and understand it. And there has been so much peace in that room as they breathed their last that it was an honor and a privilege to be there because they knew that the best was yet to come. And I don't know what you're facing in your suffering. And if I did know, I would probably weep with you and I would want to sorrow for you and to be there to help comfort you. But if in your suffering you are overwhelmed with such a great grief 
that it casts a shadow on the knowledge of your past and your future, then I want to ask you this question, and it's not an easy one. You'll be grappling with this in your community groups this week. If you are overwhelmed by your situation, is it possible that you have lost sight of your past and or your future? There is hope. And that we are in the midst of suffering. But for God's people, it's really not an option to be overwhelmed with despair. Because we know we have eternal life. And we know that sin will finally be fully destroyed. Father God, if there is someone here this morning that senses an overwhelming despair because of the suffering that they're in, May you, by your grace and power, remind them of their salvation, the surety, and be reminded of our inheritance that one day you will come and take us home and we will finally be at rest. In Jesus' name, amen. Joy to the world. Jesus is coming again. He doesn't force anyone. But as we get a full picture of his character, there's no one who will want to leave him ever. And he honors our choices. But we also know that we can have confidence in him today while he is rescuing and delivering us from the power of sin today, while we wait for that day when sin is no more and we can go home. God bless you and keep you. And may you find peace today because God has shown us great mercy. Father in heaven, you are good and holy and kind and gracious and merciful. And because of this, we have the greatest message the world could ever hear. We have something to bring to our neighbors, our co-workers, our friends. It's astounding. It's truly astounding. And may we burst with praise like Peter. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has rescued us. And in his name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Happy Sabbath.